Uh, Stanford, I think, is one of the leading um, uh, schools in semiconductor research. But um, I think as we approach to 10 nanometers, 7 nanometer, 4 nanometer uh, project, I think probably we'll expect, <laughs> industry-wise, we expect probably end up 4 nanometer, which is very close, probably in 5 to 10 years. So what uh, Stanford's view that uh, on semiconductor uh, technology that still you want to invest more on this semiconductor, uh, or you want to um, spread the fund to like biological or cloud technology, that kind of stuff. Yeah. Well, I think I think um, you are absolutely right. I mean, we're we're already seeing the slowdown in Moore's law. We're getting closer and closer to the end, and as we see it. You know, it's going to asymptotically uh, stable out. And unlike earlier times when people predicted the end of Moore's Law, it's not a manufacturing hurdle that needs to be overcome. It's a much more fundamental problem. It's a problem. We're, we're approaching the limit of what we can run, how, how small transistors can get. Even just issues like thermodynamic noise become, become important, right? So I think the goal has to be, can we find alternative technologies? Uh, can you build? Um, extension ramps of that technology. So for example, you might build extension ramps where um, logic becomes more probabilistic, where I, I won't give you, I'll give you a 99% chance that a transistor will operate correctly, but not a 100% chance. Now, can we rebuild a layer on top of that to take advantage of that technology? But we're also investing in lots of alternatives. I think carbon nanotube is the one we're probably investing the most now. Um, Philip Wong, I don't know if you saw this result, they built a MIPS processor out of carbon nanotube. Uh, so it's a small, narrow, it's not a full 32-bit processor, but they managed to build a working computer out of, uh, that is Turing complete, so you could do a computation slowly because it's only a few bits wide, um, but it's a demonstration that the technology does work. That would give us probably another, maybe another decade uh, of life if it can really be made to work, and I think um, the, the guys in the computer computer industry don't realize that their bacon has been saved by the semiconductor industry. They build this software. So the efficiency of software is going down over time, right? Because we're we're focusing much more on on productivity and software, and we're giving up efficiency in order to get more productivity. Um, that's been enabled by the fact that Moore's law has just kept and microprocessor advances have given more and more and more performance. As that starts to slow down, um, we're going to have to pay a lot more attention to efficient software because it's going to all of a sudden we're going to hit the hit the limit, um, and we've got to work on that. Obviously, other ideas, more use of parallelism will come along. You know, these kinds of things. We'll figure out how to use it better. Um, but I think we're also going to have to pay more attention to efficiency if we don't find another breakthrough in the semiconductor. Just to add to that, I, I've been here for 44 years. I was here when it really was Silicon Valley, where we had 30 semiconductor companies here. Now we have maybe, maybe three. How many people realize that almost all the advances we have in technology is due to improvements in the semiconductor process? That is the, 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 the spacing of chips on a transistor and the ability to put more powerful functions on a silicon, a silicon die. And that this, uh, is what Professor Hennessy was speaking to. Greg? Yeah.